Olá, você que nos acompanha no Nota de Rodapé, é um prazer aqui de vir com mais um Interlocuções para vocês, uh, muito especial. Hoje eu converso com ele, que é historiador britânico e um dos grandes especialistas sobre a Alemanha nazista no mundo, sendo referência para milhares de historiadores. É autor de vários livros importantes, como Em Defesa da História, Terceiro Reich, na História e na Memória, além de uma consagrada trilogia sobre a Alemanha nazista. Hoje temos o prazer de receber o professor Richard Evans para fazer essa entrevista comigo. Eu tenho a honra de estar muito bem acompanhado pela historiadora Karina Rezende, o historiador Wilson de Oliveira Neto e o historiador Vitor Calari. Nós agora vamos começar a, a nossa entrevista em inglês. Você pode ativar a legenda aí para acompanhar. Professor Evans, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, for us, Brazilian historians, is a great opportunity to, to be in touch with you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, before before I, I start with the, the questions about your work, I have a couple of curiosities that I want to, to address. Okay. Have you, ever, have you ever been in Brazil? No, I'm, I'm afraid not. So my Brazilian publishers, when my uh, three volumes on history of Nazi Germany came out, did ask me uh, would I be willing to go and launch them in uh, uh, Sao Paulo and in Rio. Uh, and I said, yes, absolutely. But they never got back to me after that. Uh, <laughs> so it would be great to come, but so far I haven't been. Are, but are you are you familiar with the work of Brazilian historians? Is there any of them that you follow, something like that? Not really, because I don't uh, I don't read Portuguese, so it is a little bit lost on me, I'm afraid. So uh, I have to say no. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that, that's not a problem. <laughs> that's not a problem. All right, prof uh, Professor, I, I will start with the, the, the first question. Uh, a few years ago, you became a movie character, uh, something hmm. unusual for our profession. Uh, and as much as I want to ask if you like the John Sessions interpretation of you, I will limit myself to asking questions related to historical knowledge. All right. Well, I should well, say, uh, I think John Sessions should have lost weight before he played me on, uh, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Important note. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the film denial reminds us of the, the historical legal dispute between historian uh, Deborah Lipstead and the Holocaust denier David Jarvin. At that time, the, the epicenter of the discussion was uh, whether or not the Jewish Holocaust existed during the Hitler's years in Nazi Germany. Even with Lipstadt's victory, uh, it is possible to say that the number of Holocaust deniers has not decreased in subsequent decades. In Brazil, there are not as many Holocaust deniers as in Europe or in the United States, but there is a strong movement here, which includes our president and the foreign minister, that claims that Nazism was left-wing. There was an episode with a YouTuber uh, with more than 3 million subscribers who made a video using out of co context quotes to say that you, Professor Richard Evans, Professor Pierre Chalnou and Richard Overy agreed that Nazism was left wing. Uh, I'm sorry to inform you, but It was perhaps in this episode that many ordinary Brazilians met you for the first time. <laughs> uh, yeah. How do you see Nazism as a space of ideological dispute in 2020? Why do people without academic training or appropriate knowledge on the subject manage to gain so much prestige and gain so many followers to propagate such absurd denialist or revisionist ideas. Hmm. Would you say uh, that perhaps we scholars, intellectuals, researchers, were dram drastically failing to communicate with these people? Well, um, that's, that's not one question, that's about 20, I guess. So um, just briefly on the film Denial, 
uh, it is about a court case in which I was uh, the main expert witness. It was a lawsuit brought in the High Court in London for defamation, for libel, by uh, the writer David Irving against an American professor who published a book in, in, in England, uh, Deborah Lipster, for calling him a Holocaust denier and a falsifier of history. So the, ca the case was not about whether the Holocaust happened. It was whether David Irving was uh, uh, manipulating the sources and essentially telling lies uh, when he said it happened. So there's a very fine line between the two. But um, that's why uh, the, uh, it depended on expert witnesses and not, for example, like the Eichmann trial in 1961 in uh, on, on calling uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And uh, Irving was defeated, he lost his lawsuit. Um, and so he was then branded in a devastating judgment by the High Court, uh, which tried tried the case, a civil action, tried the case uh, without a jury. So the judge wrote the, uh, wrote the reports, wrote the judgment, and he was branded a Holocaust denier and a falsifier of history. Uh, and that then, I think, well, in fact, it was the, uh, there were two dramatizations, drama documentaries about the case on television beforehand, uh, in one of which I was played by an actor as an old man with a white beard, because that's what they thought Cambridge professors were like. Uh, and then the other one, the second one was much, much better. Um, by uh, I was played by um, Michael Kitchen, who's an actor, um, he appeared in a couple of James Bond movies as a sort of background uh, guy in the in, in London, um, and uh, I actually chanced upon him in in the uh, in, in a street cafe in London a couple of months later. So I went up to him. I said, "You you played me on television," um, and he sort of said, "Yes, I hope I I played you well." Uh, and uh, I said, "Yes, you're much. You played me much better than I played myself because you could rehearse. I only had one chance in a winner's box, right?" Uh, and so John Sessions plays me in the movie denial. I think it became possible to make a movie when Deborah Lester published her own personal account of her experiences, which is pretty horrible for a historian to be sued for thousands and thousands of pounds uh, in the High Court. Uh, and uh, of course, she 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 won. But uh, once her book was out, then um, David Hare, the screenwriter, could could write it and it could be produced. And it's a very pretty accurate. Uh, depiction of the trial it's uh, faithful to the spirit and the letter of the uh, of the action so uh, if you want to know uh, about the action that's probably the quickest and best way of, of accessing it now that was in the year 2000 that the trial happened and uh, two things have happened since then which have changed the situation at the, that moment we thought we had discredited holocaust denial and discredited Mr. Irving. First of all, there's been the rise of Islamist extremist uh, websites, organizations, individuals, which have to some extent taken over from neo-fascists uh, as the main propagators of Holocaust denial. Though for them, it's a it's a secondary matter. It's a way of discrediting discrediting the state of Israel, um, which they see as being legitimized by the Holocaust. A much more important, I think has been the rise of social media, uh, of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of these other things. And that is where you will find, in my view, you'll find Holocaust denial. And the problem is that uh, you can, there's only opinions uh, on social media. You're limited in the amount of uh, time and space and words that you can use. So for the trial, we had 2000 pages of expert testimony from a range of different ex expert witnesses, including myself. Uh, on Twitter, you only you only have uh, you know what is it 280 characters or 100, 180 characters, I think. But you on you know even on Facebook and other things, you can't go on for page after page. So uh, opinion has become more and more central, and it's drifted away. We're in from from evidence and from argument. And so uh, you find um, you find that the opinions that there were no moon landings, it all happened in a Hollywood studio, or or that there was no Holocaust, uh, these uh, are, are spreading across the internet. You don't have now what you might call gatekeepers of ex public expression. Uh, 
like newspaper editors, magazine editors, TV, radio uh, uh, producers and so on, who will stop the more outre and more bizarre opinions coming before the public. You now have, for example, conspiracy theories have, have spread and become much more common in the last 10 to 15 years. I think largely because of the internet. Um, there's a particular conspiracy theory I've been engaging with, and it will be one of the theories in my next book, uh, which is the conspiracy theory that uh, Hitler did not commit suicide in the bunker in Berlin in 1945, but escaped and went to live in Argentina, or I'm sorry to say in one or two uh, versions of it in Brazil. Um, now there's absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever, but that doesn't stop people putting this forward. And unfortunately, some people believing it. So I think that's the main reason why there's been a resurgence of conspiracy theories and a resurgence of, uh, among them, Holocaust denial, because ultimately Holocaust denial is a conspiracy theory. Um, it's what uh, uh, we call a systemic conspiracy theory, uh, as opposed to an event conspiracy theory. So, um, because uh, I've been leading, uh, just finished, I mean, I was leading a, a re research project on conspiracy theories in Cambridge for five years, till very recently it, it, it finished. Um, and the two main types, one is the event conspiracy theory, say, President John F. Kennedy was not shot by Lee Harvey Oswald alone, but there was a conspiracy behind it, a group of people planned and plotted it. And then a systemic conspiracy theory, which sees a nationwide, global, uh, conspiracy behind the scenes um, going on for years, centuries even. Uh, Anti-Semitism could be seen as that kind of conspiracy theory, though it does not posit a, a group, particular group of people organizing it. Um, and Holocaust denial is a variety of anti-Semitism. Uh, so it says that the generally agreed uh, view of historians based on an enormous amount of evidence and testimony that up to 6 million Jews were deliberately killed by the Nazis between uh, 1933 and particularly 1941 and 1945, using methods varying from shooting into pits to in particular uh, asphyxiating, killing them in gas chambers. But that didn't happen. Uh, and that there's been a, a huge conspiracy involving all the historians in the world journalists, media, governments, to suppress this fact. Many conspiracy theories are cover-up theories. They're, cover, they're, they're theories that people have got together to cover up something. And of course, what they do is, what conspiracy do, theories do, is to uh, boost the self-esteem of the people who propagate them, uh, who say, we are the ones who know the truth. The, what they always call the official version, and there's nothing official about what I write, for example, um, is uh, is wrong, and they have the key to the truth. So um, that, I think those those are the reasons why Holocaust denial has become more common. That's it. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, actually, actually, I, I, I think I was looking for a, a word of hope. <laughs> to say what can we do with that or with them but uh, i don't think, well, think it, it, yeah a clear well, answer for it. these kinds of uh, views are irrational they are self-sealing so you can't it's very difficult to engage in rational argument uh they're within a kind of a bubble uh if um uh, i mean i you know i of course I don't engage directly with Holocaust deniers, except I did in that in that particular trial, which lasted for three months, and I was 28 hours in the witness box. But otherwise, it's futile trying to engage with them. If anybody has a serious, you know, if if, if I say, um, uh, if you say, if you're trying to attack a conspiracy theory, then uh, you get the response. So you're part of the conspiracy. So it's a kind of self-sealing system of belief. Uh, and uh, all you can do is put forward the facts and the evidence. The internet is not really a suitable place to do that, but you can point to major websites like the NISCOR website, 
you can bought to books. So as I said, I've got a book coming out very shortly uh, about conspiracy theories involving German National Socialism and Hitler, uh, where I show, um, I mean, I'm, where I show that these conspiracy theories are fantasies and lies. Uh, but I'm also interested in why people engage in them and why, why people uh, belong to them. That's all you can you can do uh, when you're confronted with lying on an epic. Scale, you all you can do is tell the truth. Have you, have you met Professor Professor Arvin after the trial? He was never a professor. He never held a university position. He never even had a university degree. He's a freelance writer. Um, all right. Only once, but not personally. I mean, he came to a lecture I gave. Uh, it was about the Second World War. I think he he thought I would do, I would talk about him, but his work is irrelevant to the serious system of Second World War, so I didn't mention him. Fair, fair enough. Okay, I invite my friend uh, Victor to ask the Victor. next question. Right. Hello, Professor Evans. Uh, my name is Victor Calari. Nice mm -hmm. to meet you. Um, I'm a PhD student here in Brazil. And my research is about the transmission of the Second World War memory yeah. by the second generation of survivors. Uh, I'm using graphic narratives like graphic novels and comic books as mm -hmm. my primary source. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. For almost 10 years, uh, I taught the course 20th Century European History uh, at university. Uh, and I am really, really proud to have introduced your work for the first time to hundreds of future historians. Well, thank you so, very much. Very kind yeah, of it's it's an honor to to be here and to be able to to participate on this interview. Uh, my first question for you, Professor Evans, uh, is about uh, a book you wrote called uh, "A Life in History," recently published. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Eric Hobsbawm, as well as some of his contemporaries like uh, Thompson and mm. Christopher Hill, acquired a lot of prestige and fame uh, all over the world, but especially here among Brazilian historians. Mm. Uh, so I'd like to ask you two questions, if it's possible. Uh, how important was their work for your formation, for you as a, a historian, uh, concepts like uh, history from below, and if it's possible, if you have any personal memories with these historians that you would like to share with us. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think the book is uh, due to appear in Brazil in translation. Um, yeah. Well, it's very long, so it will probably be next year or even the year after. Um, well, Eric Hobbs, it's a biography of Eric Hobsbawm, uh, and it is a biography. It's a story of his life, but uh, also the story of how his life related to his work, because his own autobiography depicts himself uh, as a kind of creature of um, larger historical forces. But as I see it, his own personal development and experiences fed into the kind of work that he, he did. Um, I, myself, I was born in 1947, very long time ago now, and um, I was very fortunate enough to study in Oxford when this generation of English Marxist historians really started publishing their work uh, and started making an impact. So it, when I studied at the, the late 1960s, and early 1970s, um, they had uh, left the Communist Party in 1956, uh, except for Hobsbawm, but he left it, as it were, intellectually. And his interests shifted quite markedly after that. And uh, I was also there at the beginning of the History Workshop movement. I was involved in that in the late 60s by Raphael Samuel, another of this, the youngest of this group. Uh, so they were very exciting uh, to us. This is, I'm I was a student in 1968, with all that kind of implies. Um, so we were quite radicalized. And this is the 60s. Well, somebody once said, you know, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't really part of it. But um, 
but uh, I, I uh, they were a very powerful influence, sense of liberation of, of, of the post-war order breaking up. Uh, in fact, when Winston Churchill died in 1965, I and some school friends decided this was such an important moment. It was the end of the post-war uh, era and the beginning of a new era. So we actually went to his funeral. I stood on Ludgate Hill in front of St. Paul's and I subsequently discovered some others of my generation whom I didn't know at the time also went. Um, so they were extraordinarily influential. I'll just give you one, it's a rather academic uh, um, example, but uh, I and a number of other younger British historians under the influence of the idea of history from below published uh, a collection of essays called Society and Politics in Wilhelmine, Germany. So it's about society and politics in Germany before 1914, because it was a new generation of left, leftish, left liberal German historians led by Hans Ulrich Wähler, um, which uh, saw Imperial Germany as a kind of antechamber of, of, of Nazi Germany. That's where it all started in their view. And they used functionalist Weberian sociology uh, to propagate the idea of a kind of perfectly um, of a, a, an undemocratic system which could only evolve in one direction towards that of national socialism. And so we, with history from below, we had a different approach. And so we um, we argued that uh, that wasn't the case. It was, in fact, there were many different open possibilities in in Germany before 1914. Uh, and I think we've subsequently become, been, been vindicated. I think it's now clear that the roots of Nazism really lie in the catastrophe of World War I. That is where things changed so radically and dramatically. So it was very helpful to us in looking at German history. And then there are other influences, of course. So um, uh, we were all British, but we just studied German history. And I, I've written a small book, which hardly anybody else, hardly anybody's read, in fact, called Cosmopolitan Islanders, which is, tackles the question of why do so many British historians written about France, Germany, uh, you know, Italy, Russia, um, Austria, Finland, and so on, um, and Spain. So, um, uh, and that was our generation. We were taught, I think, by, by either exiles from the continent who come over before or during the Second World War, or and by British historians who've been involved, got involved in European history through uh, through the war itself, through fighting in, in, in Germany, whatever it might have been. Um, and so we were a generation, I think, that had a very close engagement with the history of the continent. And of course, we learned the languages. You know, I learned German, I had French. Um, we, we, we all engaged and we, our books, I think now 10 of my books have been published in German. Uh, so we have an influence and a presence in those countries that we're writing about. And for us in 1968, as students, the question was about the long-term origins of fascism and Nazism, uh, because that was a time when there's a certain polarization of politics and when racism and anti-immigration politics, first of all, came, came to the fore in, in Europe and in, in Britain as well. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Okay, now, Luis Karina. Hello, everyone. Hello, Professor. Hi. He's with Hi. Hi. Uh, First of all, I want to thank Jonathan for the invitation and the opportunity to talk with you, Professor. Um, the Third Reich Trilogy was one of the first works that I read in my graduation about the Nazi thematic. Mm -hmm. And they have helped me a lot. So it's a huge pleasure to be here today. Very nice to be here. Uh, uh, well, my name is Karina. Yep. I am a primary and secondary history teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am doing my master's degree at Federal University of Minas Gerais. Mm -hmm. And I'm studying the relation between Nazism and religion specifically about the religious resistance in the Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 30s. So yes. my work about the sermons, the religious resistance, the, the idea of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I want to start to ask you about the nature of the Nazism, your um, understood of this. Um, one polemic discussion that began in the 50s was how to define the Nazi government, how to understand the nature of Nazism. 
The rise of the concept of totalitarianism for intellectuals as Hannah Arendt was a way to try to explain Nazism as a new kind of government that intends to rule the public and private life. I would like to ask uh, if you think in what measure is possible to apply this concept to analyze the Third Reich and what contributions and the problems you see in this utilization? Okay, right. So that brings me also back, Jonathan, to your point about was Nazism right wing or left wing? Um, I've never said it was left wing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, but it's not conventional. You know, it certainly wasn't. So, uh, for example, Nazism when it came to power left the entire capitalist system uh, of mm -hmm. the economy in 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 place. It did not, as Stalinism did. Um, nationalize and take over it wasn't state by the state a uh, business of, of any kind it did impose it did drive it in a certain direction uh namely towards producing goods and materials and finances for war but it it did not uh take it over and that is a major difference between stalin's russia stalin's soviet union and hitler's germany or or, or uh, Mussolini's Italy, uh, that the fascist regimes, Mussolini and Hitler, left the capitalist economy in, in, in place, in fact, repressed the labor movement. Whereas Stalin's Russia, and later on after the Second World War, uh, the satellite states, so called like Bulgaria and Poland and so on, um, abolished the capitalist economy. They had a state run economy. Uh, and that is one of the things that makes it difficult to. Uh, use the concept of totalitarianism. Um, what what drove uh, the, I mean, for example, the Stalinist, Lenin before Stalin, the, the Russian, the Soviet system, uh, basically dispossessed the middle classes, middle and upper classes, many killing many, many of them. To be bourgeois in Stalin's Russia was almost to have a, a death sentence. Um, and what they did was put the working class in, in power, although they very quickly became bureaucratized. Whereas in Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy, uh, this didn't happen at all. Um, uh, the, the, the middle classes, in fact, collaborated with and to some extent drove on the Nazi project. Uh, so uh, there are other problems uh, with the whole concept. The concept of totalitarianism really derives from the 1950s from uh, a desire of American, in particular, American political scientists to equate Soviet and Nazi systems um, and to say, we are Democrats, we are fighting against this. Uh, of course, it's a lot of it's more sophisticated. A book like Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, for example, is a very sophisticated and, 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 and intellectually exciting book. Um, the idea was that these, these figures like, to tell it, like, like Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini uh, aspired to control every aspect of people's lives, um, to organize everybody in uh, organizations like the Hitler Youth. All of German kids had to be, in, or, uh, had to be um, belong to the Hitler Youth uh, to. Um, establish a system where people did not have the freedom to vote, didn't have freedom of speech, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, that was the concept of totalitarianism. But I don't think, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to uh, for that to be possible at the, you know, in the present, in the 21st century. Society has grown far too complex. And also you can't understand fascism and Nazism and, and, and Bolshevism, communism, without seeing them all as a way of trying to deal with the horrific legacy of World War One, the tremendous, unprecedented catastrophe that overtook not just Europe, uh, particularly Europe, but also the rest of the world. And they all emerged from that and their ways of trying to build what they saw as a better future. But it's built on, of course, dividing society and propagating hatred uh, of, of one particular minority. So it, it, I don't think totalitarianism is a very useful concept. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Professor. All right, so end of this round, we invite Professor Wilton. Nice to meet you. Uh, is a very special <coughs> moment with me because your books uh, are very special for my studies, my work. Uh, I am a history teacher in the University of Joinville. Um, I study World War II reflex in Brazil through press, photos, and Nazi regime. I work to press documents, uh, reviews, newspapers, uh, uh, WordPress, photographies. And I have interest in German history. Uh, my question is, how did you get involved with the history of Germany? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as I said, I was born in 1947 and I grew up uh, on the sort of eastern edges of London. So I used to go into the east east end of London, uh, shopping with my parents and, and that kind of thing. And I would see all these bomb sites, rows of, uh, rows of terraced houses with gaps in them where the house had been bombed like a kind of row of teeth with two or three teeth missing in every every one. And um, I began to wonder who had done this, of course. Where, why were these houses destroyed? Uh, and so that started asking, uh, got me to asking questions about Germany. And then, of course, in the 1950s, as I was very small, but uh, my parents would talk about the war. They'd been involved in it. Um, as I said, Winston Churchill was prime minister in, in the early 1950s, and he died in 1965. The politicians were wartime politicians. Um, and I remember my mother taking me to uh, films, war films at the cinema. Um, she was a school teacher and, and in the holidays, she would have a day, we have a, a, a day out in the West End where she would um, you know, buy clothes and stuff. And then, then we go to the cinema, uh, films like Reach for the Sky or uh, the Dam Busters, um, those those kinds of war films. So all of that, I think, got me very interested. And then when I went to Oxford as a student, this was, as I said, in 1968, a time when the neo-fascist movement of the NPD became, was beginning in Germany, when the National Front was beginning in, uh, in, in the UK, and particularly when German history, which had been very kind of quiet, uh, because in West Germany, there was a kind of amnesia uh, in the late 40s and through the 50s and, uh, where, where people really wanted to forget about the Nazi period and get on with rebuilding their lives and building the economy, so-called economic miracle. It was very materialistic. But in the 60s, that began to change. Uh, and uh, particularly the consensus that had been between German historians from 1918 up to about 1960, uh, that Germany was not mainly responsible for World War I, was broken by a historian called Fritz Fischer, who wrote a book about Germany's war aims in 1914 to 18, which uh, showed definitively that they were in enormously ambitious, that Germany wanted to conquer large parts of Europe, annex territory and, and, and expand its overseas empire and so on. Um, and Fisher came to Oxford when I was an undergraduate and it was very impressive to see how he uh, generated enormous excitement in the, in the um, Oxford historical community. I remember seeing Christopher Hill sitting on the floor in his lecture because there weren't any seats available and Trevor Roper and Taylor and uh, all of these great figures. Uh, and I thought this is a really exciting area to be involved in. It has contemporary political relevance. It's causing massive uh, controversies in Germany itself. Um, 
And, you know, Fisher was refused permission, refused funding by the German Foreign Office to give a lecture to it, you know, arranged in America, whereupon American historians raised the money. And so he went over uh, there and he was quite a charismatic figure. So I got to know him. In fact, I went to then I, I decided uh, this is this is really exciting. So I will write a dissertation, my PhD, uh, after I graduated on uh, German liberalism before 19. 18 from 1890 odd uh, or so to see whether it really was liberal or was it you know did, when did German middle classes desert liberalism uh, uh, and and become sympathetic to the far right as they did in the 1920s or was liberalism undermined from Berlin uh, and I went to study in Hamburg with a scholarship and uh, there I met Fischer and I met his pupils his assistants. Uh, it was a very heady, still uh, heady atmosphere, got a kind of crusading feeling. Uh, so I learned German. I had French and Latin, but I learned, learned German. Once, if you have Latin, it's not difficult to learn another um, Indo-European language. It's like the same scaffolding. You just fill it with different kind of words. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and that's what got me really interested. And because once you get into uh, a subject, it's, it's, um, it just, you, more questions come up and here I am, you know, 50 years later, still doing it. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, well, Professor, I will start the, the second round of the questions. Okay. Uh, but actually, I, I would not be able to resist a small and respectful provocation. <coughs> you are you are admired and respected by many historians around the world, but one specifically may not have all this affection for you, and I'm talking about Professor Norman Finkelstein. Mm. Uh, uh, Finkelstein, who claims to be an, a Zionist leftist militant. Is the author of the bestseller The Holocaust Industry and attacks, among other things, Jewish protagonism in the Nazi Holocaust. Well, recently in a video conference, he said, and I quote him David Arvin was a very good historian. I don't care what Richard Evans says, he produced the work that are substantive. If you don't like it, don't read it. In the case of Arvin, he knew a thing or two or three. Uh, Finkelstein is a very controversial figure, and his mm. work with the Jews and the left is at least controversial. Uh, I, would, I would like to you to talk about your relationship with him, of course, as historian, and how you see his work its importance, relevance, and controversy. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, I think we did prove um, beyond doubt that Irving's work, as a, his historical writings, are completely unreliable. And you just have to read The Judgment, which is online, or read my book, Lying About Hitler, or uh, there's plenty of other books, uh, Robert Jan van Pelt's book, uh, The Case for Auschwitz, um, Peter Longrich's book. So the, the, the extra witness reports, so then we're kind of, we re re rewrote them and published them. Uh, you cannot rely on anything Irving says or writes. Um, he systematically distorts the, uh, the evidence. Uh, and, and so you, you just really can't do that. He's made some because he had a certain reputation as being sympathetic to the Nazis, he did gain access to um, to material held by old Nazis or their families, uh, and, uh, which other historians have not been able to uh, obtain. But uh, again, it's the question is what he does with them, uh, what he does with the, the, the evidence. So I just, I think the, that, and that leads me on to say that Normal Finkelstein is, uh, I mean, he's just a very superficial uh, writer. He doesn't go into the evidence with any great care. So I don't really take him very seriously. 
you you've never met him you've never had the opportunity to talk to him or debate um i did yes i read his stuff but i couldn't it just just um it's very polemical it's politically polemical and there's a clear political drive behind it he does not interested in weighing up the evidence i know i met him after that i i have plenty of other enemies and critics as well um mostly on the right All right, Professor. Uh, please, Victor. Oh, yeah. uh, Professor Evans, uh, I want to, to uh, take you back for uh, uh, your first works. Uh, at the beginning of your career, you dedicated yourself to researching the feminist movement in Germany. And uh, I think it was possible to, to demonstrate how German nationalism affected the development of this movement. Uh, but in the last 15 years, uh, Germany uh, has been ruled by a woman, not necessarily a feminist, okay? Uh, but more than 40 years after your research, how do you see this relationship between German nationalism and the feminist movement today? Goodness. Well, um, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I wanted from my doctorate to research a liberal movement of social reform and look at its ideology and its practice and its important success and failures. And I published that as the Feminist Movement in Germany from 1894, uh, which is when the German Council of Women was founded, to 1933, when it was wound up by, by the Nazis. And I think I showed that just before the First World War, it moved very sharply to the right on the impact of criticism from conservative nationalists who thought that uh, feminism was destroying the German family and causing German women not to have children and uh, was pacifist and so on. Um, and it was very exciting because nobody had ever written about it before. Amazingly enough, uh, in, in the 1970s, uh, I was the first person to write a serious book about it and I kind of rediscovered the, the lost history of radical feminism uh, which was eventually snuffed out by the more conservative wing of the, of the feminist movement. Uh, so that made German women susceptible to the lure of Nazism um, and uh, this is quite a large number of women belong to the, 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 the these various feminist organizations um, both before and after World War One. Uh, and of course, women had to vote, and more women than men voted for the Nazi Party, largely because there were more women. A lot of men have been thousands, millions of men have been killed in the First World War, and women lived longer than men anyway. So, uh, the women's vote was really very, very important. And uh, my argument was that the feminist movement, in the end, kind of softened up German middle class women uh, for the appeal of Nazism. Um, I don't think you can compare, you know, there's no comparison with today uh, at all, really. I think German society has changed hugely even since I first became acquainted with it personally in the 1970s. Uh, women have a much more equal uh, position now in German society. There's a long way to go, but it's very different from the entirely male-dominated uh, politics, for example, of the 19, 1960s and 70s. Uh, and until very recently, until the coming of Angela Merkel, it would have been impossible, I think, for unthinkable for a woman to be the federal chancellor of, uh, of Germany. Um, I mean, the feminist movement has gone through various uh, phases since, um, since the 19, 1970s. Um, but but it, it, I don't think it's infused with nationalism and uh, anyway at all now it's a liberal left-wing movement and in fact the issues it concentrates on uh, it, the, the, are, are very different so the feminist movement in germany the modern feminist movement really began in the 1970s with uh the struggles over the abortion law Abor abortion was illegal in west germany under paragraph 218 of the uh of the criminal code and th that struggle brought brought women together uh, and, and the formation of the women's movement. So that is itself has nothing really to do with uh, nationalism. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, Karina. 
<laughs> okay. Um, Evans, I think this question is a little bit longer, but it's for a context. Okay. Um, in your discussion about the German population during the Third Reich, you showed, especially in the Third Reich, in history and memory, mm. that coercion and violence had an important role for setting Nazism since 1933 in large scale, no? right? Um, you wrote about the difficulty to apply the concept of consent in this kind of situation when the human being cannot choose between real alternatives. Mm. Uh, you reject the dictatorship by consent idea. Um, I quote you when you wrote that the principal instrument of terror in Nazi Germany was not the concentration camp, but the law. My question actually are uh, my questions actually are not about the public opinion in the third right and popular reactions, but actually about the convicted Nazis, if we can talk then like this. Um, you admitted a role of propaganda and the capacity of leadership to mobilize thoughts and wishes that already exist in some groups of German populations. And uh, here I am thinking, Professor, about people who actively support the policies and the ideology, helped it to spread, were members of Nazi party, and some example of actions as people who sang to Hitler on Sunday service, Nazi members who claimed in two days that the Nazi ideology as an explanation for everything, for hmm. example, and some mobilizations as the writings of Alfred Rosenberg, Smith of 20th century, and Hitler's writing in my camp when he said the national socialism was a new faith. And this kind of thing increased this discussion. Um, this had been explained from, for example, as ideology, as fanatism, as political religion, as myth mobilization over the last decades. I would like to ask, how could we understand the power for advisions like this? Um, do you think it's possible to see, for example, speeches and some acts of Hitler and Nazis as a mobilization of faith and beliefs in political sphere. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, yes. So, uh, in, um, in, yeah, there's again several questions there. So, what, one question is about the role of coercion violence uh, in establishing the Nazi dictatorship. And you have to remember, on the one hand, well, you, what you have to remember, of course, is that. Between one and 200,000 opponents of the Nazis were put into concentration camps, tortured, beaten, and uh, in 1933, uh, and released only on the promise of not taking part in political activity again. And there are many other sanctions, uh, as I explain in the book you, you, you mentioned, um, against people who opposed the regime, mostly, mostly socialists and communists, some liberals, some Catholics. And uh, they, uh, uh, when, when you get to 1934 or five, you find a fewer than 4,000 inmates in the concentration camps. And so some historians have argued that this shows that everyone supported the Nazi regime, there was no more opposition. But what I have not seen is the fact that in from the summer and autumn of 1933, the first year of the Nazi dictatorship, um, the task of repression was passed over to the legal system. Lots of new laws were passed, i.e. decrees issued by Hitler and the, and the Nazi leadership, which made, uh, which, which had a lot of new treason laws, new treasonable offenses. So you were arrested by the police, if you didn't go engage in opposition, if you're found putting up posters opposing the Nazis, it's that kind of thing. Uh, you were arrested by the police, you were tried in the courts, and you were sent to a prison, not to a concentration camp. So if there's fewer than 4,000 inmates of the camps in 1935, you look at the prisons, and there are 23,000 people there in prison, classified as political offenders. And the same, interestingly, is the case with homosexuality. Now, a lot of uh, people seem to think that the Nazis made uh, sex between men uh, uh, an offence and put 
gay people, gay men into concentration camps. But in fact, it was already illegal under the Criminal Code of 1871. And the Nazis changed the law so to make it uh, to uh, previously only penetration had been an offense. Now, any kind of physical interaction between two men of a sexual nature was made an offense. But they're still tried by the courts. Homosexuals are still arrested by the police. They're tried in the courts and they go into a prison. So it's the prisons, the legal system uh, that you have to have to look. Now, increasingly, the Gestapo would be waiting at the prison gates for homosexuals who finished their term of imprisonment and thus take them off to the to, to the camps. But uh, and the other thing it's important to say is that actually more uh, gay men were condemned and imprisoned under the post-war regime of Konrad Adenauer in West Germany than under the Nazis. So you have to get this all in perspective. So coercion was passed over to a lot of coercion was passed over to the, the, the regular legal and police and prison apparatus uh, and coercion violence the threat of being beaten tortured shot killed imprisoned uh was uh, ever present in nazi nazi germany but that's a parallel the other side of it is propaganda is the um uh you know, I mean, this is a dictatorship, okay, in which opposition of any kind is illegal, in which opposition newspapers are closed down, um, opposition politicians are arrested or sent into exile. You can't, there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of action, uh, no freedom of organization. All organizations, apart from the churches and the army, are Nazi organizations. But that allows then Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister, minister and this. Minister for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda was established by the Nazis in 1933, and the whole of the media were controlled directly by the Nazis. Goebbels, the minister, would hold daily press conferences, which he'd tell people, news agencies, representatives of the press, media, the um, newsreel, the cinema, uh, what to say and what not to say. So it was very carefully orchestrated and, con uh, and controlled, and it pumped out masses and masses of propaganda for the for the regime. Uh, and that, I think, uh, both of those had had an effect. People were afraid to oppose the regime, uh, but a lot of people were persuaded. But then you have to differentiate. You know that the regime is a good thing. So then you have you know, have to differentiate. Um, obviously, older Germans had acquired their values and beliefs before 1933, uh, retained them largely. Uh, it's younger Germans who uh, went through school with the Hitler youth uh, that were more susceptible to them. Um, the Protestants were more liable to support the Nazis than Catholics were. Uh, that some issues um, for example, economic recovery were quite popular after 1936. It's generated by rearmament, essentially. Um, other issues like attacks on the Catholic Church were not popular. Foreign policy was popular so long as Hitler's achievements, leaving the League of Nations, the uh, remilitarization of the Rhineland, the Anschluss of Austria, the incorporation of part of Czechoslovakia, all of that was achieved with very little bloodshed. People in Germany, on the whole, did not want another war. They'd been through the first war, and they knew that the um, that that bombing, aerial bombardment, uh, would devastate German cities, and they were right to be afraid of afraid of that. Um, so they did not really want a war, and that's the biggest failure of Nazi propaganda. They, the whole of the Nazi propaganda effort was designed to make Germans want war, uh, and in the end, they didn't. The, the American correspondent, William L. Shira, who was of course still in Berlin before America uh, entered the war in 1941, um, he reported, he, he went round on the beginning of September, um, when war was declared, uh, looking for scenes like August 1914, where there have been massive crowds in all the great squares of Germany mm -hmm. cheering on uh, the war, saying what a great thing it is. Nobody, the streets are completely empty.
Uh, I, I would like to repeat, if you allow. Um, you show in Third Reich in Power several perceptions among the more important members of Nazi government about uh, religion and the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote, and now I will quote you, uh, that yet the Nazi regard the church as the strongest and the toughest reservoir of ideological opposition to the principles they believe in. Mm -hmm. If they could win the ideological battle against them, then it would be easy to mold the whole German people into an anonymous Nazi mass. Do you think the stabilization of Nazi ideology among German people was, with a terror environment, a sole battle during the 30s, expecting the Germans really believing in the ideology? Mm -hmm. Or the belief questions, it's not so important if they made everything the ideology claims, for example? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, initially, of course, they wanted to mould the German people in their own image and to uh, erase, to get rid of any kind of ideological alternatives. Um, but this was very, very difficult, um, particularly with the Catholic Church, but also with the Protestant Church. So the, the Germany is unusual and it's, it's a European country that's divided between uh, a, a Protestant majority, but a very large Catholic minority, it's roughly sort of 60, 40, a little bit more than 60, a little bit less than 40 percent. And the, um, the the German, the Protestant uh, church it was strongly identified with the state. But the move to change the Protestant Christianity by the sort of what they call German Christians into a, a, a religion that was uh, for example, believe that um, uh, the uh, uh, that that Jesus was not Jewish, but a, a so-called Aryan. Um, mm -hmm. That the Old Testament should be got rid of because it was Jewish, and so on. All of that really ultimately failed. Uh, and the idea of creating a, a hundred percent all Nazi German population that also failed. And what I argue is that by the time the war came, there was a kind of tacit agreement that the Nazis were happy if people showed uh, enthusiasm outwardly, that they hung out their flags on uh, from their windows on Hitler's birthday, for example. Uh, uh, but they didn't want, you know, they, they realized it was impossible to uh, completely convert everybody. Uh, and on the other hand, the uh, people were, were just happy to get on with their lives, as it were, uh, so long as the Nazis left them alone in, in, in key areas of family life and so on. That, that was more difficult, but uh, there's a sort of sort of tacit agreement. Okay, thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay, Professor Wilson. Professor Evans, you have taken part in different discussions about the Third Reich, especially in Historic Streit mm -hmm. and Abra Lipstad Pegging Books. Yes, David Irving. What lessons have you learned about the way history is written in such events? Well, I'm. Um, I, I, you, you mean you're taking about public history, as it were? Is that what you're referring to? I'm not quite your, sure what you're asking. Um, but I, I, what I will say is that. I do think it's important for history to have a profile, a public profile. Of course, it's fine for historians to spend, you know, 20 years producing a definitive edition of a medieval chronicle. Um, or, uh, but uh, I think those of us who can and, and are interested in it, we really should engage in, in the public uh, in different areas. So, for example, I mean, I found it very important to when the Conservative Education Secretary and David Cameron's coalition government in 2010, Michael Gove, um, proposed to change the school history curriculum in, in England to one that just dealt only with British history uh, and had a celebratory patriotic myth at its centre, uh, that we historians should say, no, this is wrong, that history is a critical discipline. History is about, uh, not about memorising the names of and dates of kings and queens, but it's about teaching students to think critically uh, about evidence and, and to look at the evidence and to question 
uh, what they're presented with. So, and in the end, in fact, we made him withdraw his curriculum. Um, so, with that, uh, but this this is a perennial dispute. There's massive disputes going on now in the UK about, as in the USA, about um, the role of history in public and and national uh, in national memory, which I think too many people confuse memory and history, uh, particularly about uh, statues. Uh, and there's been a, a move uh, partially successful to take down statues put up in English cities, uh, commemorating uh, men who have turned out to be slave owners, for example, um, which I support. Um, I think statues are not about the past. They're about the present and the future. They're about who we think we are and what we want to be. Uh, but that's to do with memory and its function, historical, cultural memory, uh, which is, again, different from personal individual memory. Uh, that's about its role in public life. So I do think it's important for historians to engage in in public, and um, I've been privileged to be in a position to to do that on, on more than one occasion. Uh, and I took part in the 80s, a long time ago now, uh, in, in Germany in, in a, um, a dispute called the Historians' Dispute or Historica Streit, uh, again, about... Uh, with some German historians who wanted to draw a line under the German past and forget about Nazism, to put it very crudely, uh, and I argued against them. And my book was published in German um, and, and had some, because I think their argument was um, mistaken and rested on distortions. Uh, and my next book, uh, again, will be coming back to what we were discussing earlier, about conspiracy theories and taking the examples of conspiracy theories that have been applied to or allegedly influencing Nazi Germany. So the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Stab at the Back Myth of 1918, the Reichstag Fire, the flight of Rudolf Hess, deputy leader of the party, to Scotland, and Hitler's alleged uh, disappearance of the bunker, escape. Uh, all of those are examples of conspiracy theories. And I think in, by discussing them, I'm hoping to make a contribution to questioning uh, the role of conspiracy theories in, uh, in in the present day in the media and the internet, and indeed in politics. Okay. All right, yeah. Jonathan, say, do you, you think I can I can use uh, uh, Wilson's uh, questions to 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 make another question for Professor about this Please. public history? Yeah. You can, yeah. <laughs> Uh, earlier in this uh, interview, Professor, you mentioned uh, when you were growing up, you were uh, you liked it to to watch movies about the the war. Uh, how how do you think that uh, movies and the cinema history uh, can talk to the public? in this uh, uh, public history debate do do you do you like for example darkest hour about churchill uh and movies like this do you still like watching uh, movies about world war well, ii i didn't say i like to watch them i said my mother took them took me to watch them <laughs> really have a choice when i was seven or eight years old um uh so uh I, you know they were memorable they've seen very good movies um, and, and I think they're good movies now, I think. But of course, um, it's no coincidence that there have been so many movies in Britain about uh, Winston Churchill, because it's all bound up with Brexit. The idea of our finest hour is fighting, you know, allegedly alone. No, in fact, it wasn't alone uh, against the Nazis. It's, it's all part of generating a myth. So I can appreciate Gary Oldman's portrayal of, of Churchill, for example, who's a great, great actor, uh, while at the same questioning, same time questioning the motives. Uh, and um, of course, in order to make a movie, you have to distort history to some extent. You can try, you can try and keep as faithful to it, it, the, it as you can, but in the end, to make a good story, you've got to either put new, um, uh, new new things in or take things out or mold or, or or shape them you know these 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 movies that people say uh, at the beginning i said this is based on a true story only the facts have been changed uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, i mean my friend ian kershaw who wrote a great biography of of, of hitler was involved in a two-part as historical advisor to a two-part 
um, drama documentary, a, a drama about the rise of the rise of Hitler, the rise of evil, I think it was called. Uh, and the first part followed his advice. It had Robert Carlyle doing a brilliant uh, portrayal of, of Hitler in the early to mid 1920s. But the producers weren't very happy with it. Uh, they, they thought it needed uh, the injection of an imaginary character whom viewers can identify with in some way. Uh, and they insisted on that, so he resigned. And the second part uh, is terrible. It, it's a really awful, uh, you know, badly put together, unconvincing, so on. So I do, you know, I do think, again, we as historians should be more than happy to advise on fictional representations of of the past. Um, but sometimes it can be a bit surprising. So I was. Um, I was, I was a historical advisor to a, a detective um, series, and I, I, one episode, uh, uh, it was called Waking the Dead. It was about cold cases. And this one involved the detective discovering or, or investigating some old sort of human remains that dated from uh, early post-war London. And it all went back to Auschwitz and uh, you know, criminals who'd escaped and so on. So I asked to see the script, the screenplay, and I got the screenplay, and there were various mistakes it made. So it had like Dr. Mengele, the the doctor at the Auschwitz experimental, you know, experiment on humans and so on, was in Auschwitz at the beginning of 1945, but he'd left long before that. And then I said, well, I said, we can't change it. It's all been, you know, it's all been done. And in the end, when I went on set, my only function was to, answer a query they were very worried about, uh, uh, which was, did SS officers button up the top button on their jackets or not on their uniforms? That's what they wanted to know. Because if they got it wrong, they'd have viewers will be writing in complaining. So sometimes your your advice is completely disregarded. I was another, I mean, a friend of mine did the same thing. The young Indiana Jones was an episode in Ireland in 1916. And she got the um, got the, the screenplay, and she she said, no, "It's not possible. You you've got a, a poster up here, nineteen sixteen, that wasn't actually put up until nineteen seventeen, and so on and so forth." I said, "No, oh, we can't change it." So she said, "Well, can you take my name off the credits?" I said, "No, no, we we you paid you, you got the contract, but don't worry, the credits go out so fast, nobody will be able to see them anyway." So. <laughs> Thank you, professor. Uh, professor. Can can we have another round? Um, okay, give me a quarter of an hour. Quick round, yeah. Have a quick round. All right, on. okay. Uh, I, I I wouldn't ask that, but I am a, a PhD student at the University of Campinas, and my current research is about Nazi groups in South Africa mm. uh, during third the 30s and 40s and i think it's important to ask you that uh with the advent of what professor sanjay subramanian calls mm. connected hist uh, uh, history or global history we see more and more research that takes a transnational look at historical events mm. as we know uh, the, the nazi experience was not just in germany of course it was only in germany that there was an official nazi <coughs> government but in several other countries, there were political groups with Nazi influence or who proclaimed themselves Nazis, even in Brazil. Mm. Uh, do you see that, uh, that research on Nazism is taking the same path to be analyzed from a transnational perspective? How do you analyze the current historiographical trends about yeah. the, this yeah. movement? Well, yes, I mean, I think... Uh, one big change has come about, which I think I talk about in my book, The Third Reich in History and Memory, uh, is that um, until fairly recently, uh, historians used to see the origins of Nazi ideology, the Nazism, entirely within German history. But now I think people are uh, much more inclined to see it as being an amalgam of many different kinds of European influences, whether it's social Darwinism from Britain or racism, racial theory from France, um, or uh, uh, influences, of course, from Mussolini, but also from Kemal Ataturk in, in Turkey, um, 
that uh, ideas of anti-Bolshevism and anti-Semitism from Russia. So all of these things, I think we see it in a much in a different way now. I think you can uh, also talk about fascism uh, being a, a, a style and to some extent an ideology, but that you have to, uh, so uh, there's a wonderful episode of the comic writer from the 1930s, P.G. Woodhouse in his stories of Jeeves and Worcester, where the fascist leader has made fun of, and um, uh, his movement is called the Black Shorts. And uh, so Worcester says, oh, why black shorts, you know? And he said, well, we, they, we run out of colors for the shirts, you know? I mean, there's the green shirts in this country, the blue shirts there, the black shirts and so on. So um, there's, it's a certain style. There, but I think you have to be aware of uh, significant national differences. And the one that's always pointed to, I think is rightly, is the fact that uh, whereas Nazism in Germany was built on anti-Semitism, Anti-Semitism was not a significant part of Italian fascism until it fell under the influence of Nazi Germany in the end of towards the end of the 1930s. Uh, and anti-Semitism has, on the whole, not been an important part of Italian society or or, or political culture. So, um, and I think uh, you know it's it's um, it's important to remember that the nation and nationalism were really, really important in the 19th and first half of the 20th centuries and not to lose sight of that fact that there were significant national national differences. So I think you have to balance out the transnational approach with that. It's what I tried to do in my history of 19th century Europe called The Pursuit of Power, which I published four years ago. Um, I try and look at Europe in transnational terms while remaining alive to differences between different nations. All right, Professor, thank you very much. Victor. Uh, professor, uh, in historiographical terms, you faced the challenge of debating against uh, Holocaust deniers. And more recently, uh, you faced the challenge of debating against postmodernists. Mm. In your opinion, uh, what will be the main challenges that historians will face in the coming years? Um, well, I think uh, actually it's not so much an intellectual challenge. With the um, revolt against um, globalization and the nas increasing nationalism uh, of populist governments or governments like our own in, the U in, in England, uh, which have a populist slant as it were um i think there's more and more pressure from the governments and the state to purvey a nationalist account of history and this is at a time when history has become more transnational and more global uh, so i think there's a growing gap between the historical profession and governments and pop particularly populist political parties i think that's a major challenge okay thank you Karina. Uh, okay. I think this question will be a kind of personal one compared mm -hmm. to another. Um, in one of your interviews in Australian National University, I was very curious when you said that one of the most exciting moments for you as a historian was when you could write about a subject that had not been written yet. And yeah. in that moment, we were talking about uh, your research about women in Nazi Germany that we already talked before. Um, you have several books, studies about so many aspects of Nazi Germany. And I would like to know, do you have a memory of one particular document, any specific research that was a surprising work that was yeah. a milestone for you? Well, yes, I mean, um... Um, I think, you know, the, there are a few things to compare with the excitement of actually finding original documents that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, and it's, I've been lucky enough to have that happen several times in my, in my career. So, for example, um, when I was writing my dissertation uh, on, on the, the feminist movement, uh, I wanted to look at the German evangelical women's movement. Uh, it, it's a kind of conservative feminist movement that came into the 
um, into the into the main organization of the feminist movement in 1908, when it was legal, became legal for women to take part in politics in Prussia. And uh, it was uh, tracked down their papers, which were in the attic of a girl's home in Hanover. So I got permission to go there and I sort of went up a ladder and there were all the documents. Nobody had ever looked at them since they were written. And I wanted to know, I wanted to find a document, if possible, that's that well, it, it, which made it clear that they had entered the mainstream feminist movement in order to turn it in, with the aim of turning it into a more conservative direction. And I found the document and I thought, bingo, you know, Eureka, there it was. They said it in black and white. Uh, or another way, I mean, a document can be, can be uh, a kind of an inspiration to look at a new research project. So after I'd done all that, I was interested in the themes of authority and obedience in German society. And I thought I would go and look at the Prussian Ministry of Justice archive, which went from the 18th century till the mid 1930s. And uh, it was in West Berlin. It was the only Prussian ministry of the archive was in West Berlin. The rest were all in the East. It, this is in the 1970s, late 70s. And uh, I just had a curiosity. I, I looked at the, the, you know, you have a kind of handwritten list of the documents that they had. None of it's digitized or anything like that. And um, it said execution. So I looked up under capital punishment, which is in, carried out in public with a handheld axe in Germany until in Prussia until the, until the 1850s, 1860s. And um, I found this description of a, a public execution with a crown, a scaffold, with a crowd around it. I said, in 1854, this was, I said, um, when, when the man's head was cut off, um, people rushed up with drinking beakers from the audience and caught the blood and drank it. I thought, this is pretty amazing for 1854. Uh, so I wanted to know more about that. So I researched that. It became more and more extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, this is the 19th century. It's meant to be kind of civilized, modern society. So uh, in the end, I, I ended up by writing a, a, a big book about uh, capital punishment in German history uh, from 1532 to 1987. Uh, uh, and so that kind of sparked my interest there. Or, or the final one was, um, I'll give you an example, was when... I wrote a book about cholera in Hamburg in 1892 because it, it, in the end I, I was trying to find out about social differences and all the files began in 1892 with this epidemic. Uh, so <clears throat> I went into it more in depth and I found in the files um, the reports from pubs and bars and inns of what people were saying, mainly working class ones, uh, on, you know, on um, about the cholera. So when I finished my research, I asked the archivist, uh, you know, are there, is there any more of this stuff? So he looked it up and said, yes, there are these things called Berichte ohne Wert, um, worthless reports. Uh, we're going to have a look. So I went with him down to the room and there's an entire, entire room full of them, um, which nobody had ever read. And so that, again, that was very exciting. I did a book out of that as well. That's amazing. Uh, if you allow me, I want to uh, link it with another question okay. that I, I think it's related uh, with your already said about the global history and mm -hmm. the new sentences. Um, there has been a sea of works about Nazi Germany in so many countries, right, in mm -hmm. the last few decades. Um, can you see in this moment a uh, historiography tendencies for some thematics in studies related to Nazism? Can I think of what? I'm sorry. Uh, if you can see uh, studies related to Nazism, yeah. uh, uh, historiography tendencies in these studies. Yes, yes. Well, um, in the last few years, it's been a, uh, a trend towards arguing that the Nazis boast of creating a Volksgemeinschaft or a, an organic national racial community in which all Germans participated, um, which used to be thought of uh, as, as a kind of propaganda boast, which concealed a class-based reality of social differences and a mass of dissent, which is essentially the burden of the work of Ian Kershaw. Um, that that was a reality, that the Volksgemeinschaft really did exist, that, that ordinary people really were rabidly anti-Semitic and so on. That, that has been a major trend. I think that's been very important. 
uh, well, I don't particularly, I mean, I don't accept it all, uh, but, but, but there's been a lot of very interesting work based on it. Thank you. Okay. Last question, I guess. Professor Evans, you have um, in fascism a warning, Madeleine Albright. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. Call attention to political regimes that present anti democratic mm. or even fascist characteristics, mm. such as Russia and Turkey. Yeah. The return of fascism a possibility? Well, history never repeats itself. Um, and um, it's important to realize that circumstances change if only because we know what happened last time and so we're better prepared for it um i think uh fascism is very much the creation of world war one uh because it's a very military style of politics uh in uh germany in the 1920s and early 19 well, right through the 30s and early 40s you know everybody would seem to be wearing a uniform uh, the brown shirts, the Nazi stormtroopers had 200,000, 2 million armed and uniformed men on the streets beating up their opponents. Um, they, the drive to war was central to fascism. Mussolini's conquest of, uh, you know, uh, Ethiopia or Albania, his drive to, to create a, a military empire. Hitler's drive to dominate and conquer other European countries. All of that was central to fascism. And these are things you do not see in fascism today. But um, I think uh, there are clearly, I think, uh, I think populism is a more useful, um, more useful concept. Uh, all fascists were populists, but not all populists are fascists. And uh, you find populist leaders like your own president, uh, or Viktor Orban, or indeed Donald Trump, um, who are clearly anti-democratic. They're anti-science. Now, that's a very, very big difference from the fascists of the interwar years who claimed that their regime, like Hitler claimed, his regime was based on science. It's something we might not recognize as science, but he was based on eugenics, racial science. Um, science had a very high prestige. Uh, now, I think, populist leaders see scientists as part of the elite that they want to destroy or undermine or disempower. Um, so they are all opposed to the, the science of global warming. They have all uh, dismissed the coronavirus uh, epidemic as something that's not real um, and, and all of these, this anti-science. So that's something I think quite, quite new. So I think we have to be, uh, we have to be alive to echoes of fascism. Okay, in, in what people are saying, what these populists are saying, um, and certainly to the threat they pose to democracy. But we also have to be aware of the differences. Because in the end, if you want to defend democracy in the 21st century, you have to use, as it were, the weapons of the 21st century and the ideas of the 21st century. And you cannot fight uh, the current very disturbing attack on democracy across the world with the weapons of Democrats in the 1920s. Right, I think that's probably it. My voice is getting a bit tired, I have a drink. Thank you, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, are very, very nice to talk oh, to you. Thank, you thank you very much. Good luck with your studies, for your doctorates. Thank you very much, Professor. And okay. I hope to see you in another opportunity. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Yeah. Okay, very nice to meet bye you bye. all. Thank you, okay. Professor. Say goodbye. Okay. Bye bye.